Uh, we have uh, our uh, part of our executive committee is Karen Adoesti, and uh, she is our treasurer, and she's the one that brings us good news. Uh, all oh, the time. you're the <laughs> you're you're the ones that create the good news. I just noted for the record, so I don't get any credit right. for that at all. Uh -uh. No, we give you credit for everything that you do. I don't care if it's even if you call me on stuff. <laughs> but Karen Karen Adoesti is uh, is a national figure with the uh, uh, ADL. No, um, not anymore. Soon, soon no. to be. I was just gonna say, soon to be retired. Yeah, Re just She's on to my done. next on to my next gig. But uh, uh, it's been a week, so <laughs> it's for real. So. Wow! On to the next thing. You joining the club? Yes, yeah, Sandra. <laughs> how are you? You're going to yeah, be busy. You really? thirtieth. you know, you're going to be busier than ever, and so am I. So there we go. Yep. <laughs> yeah, more busy, I guess. And mm -hmm. then we have Alejandra E. Johnson. Uh, Alejandra's on our board. And I think you know each other, huh? Yes, we do. Okay, yeah, I do. see, you were so excited to see her. <laughs> Alejandra. I'm so to see her. Now that COVID is moving past, um, we need to have lunch, girl. Yes. We do. Yes, we, yes, we do. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma our, our brunch. I An miss outdoor brunch so much. Thing will be perfectly safe. Awesome. Yes. Yes. I am so glad to have you here. I cannot tell you. I wasn't actually involved in getting you. I mean, that's the great board that I'm on. Uh, you know, well, all of, uh, everybody here, uh, Tony and Maria, Karen, uh, you know, just all doing all this great work. And so when I saw your name, I may have missed that meeting or I'm not sure how it happened, but I'm like, Heather's coming. Oh my God, that's awesome. So well, I can tell I, you how it happened. I met Tony, and you don't say no to Tony. I how he is quickly he is. discovered that once he gets it in his head, <laughs> that you need to be part of it. So I met him at a vaccine event that we had planned. It kind of was a bust, but it was not a bust because we got to network and meet so many great people. And so I met Tony, and I was telling him about the mission and what we're trying to do with in purpose. And the next thing I know, boom, 24 hours later, it was like, here's the day that you're speaking. And here <laughs> I just mentioned you in a presentation you so yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I just mentioned you in a presentation yesterday because I, I give this uh, breaking down systemic inequities via strategic estate planning. And so to kind of depending on the group, if it's a group of attorneys or if it's a group of non-attorneys, you know, tailor it as needed. But I always have, you know, local resources. And I'm like, you know, Kim Norwood and uh, Reverend Blackman and all these people. And I'm like, and Heather Fleming and your book is there. It's like all these books at the bottom. I have like the, you know, just like the, the graphic from each book. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I just mentioned you yesterday. I'm so glad to have you here. And I'm sorry to take up so much Well, time. yeah, uh, Ms. Fleming. Good afternoon. It's like Can you say? Hello to everybody. And, uh, let me finish introducing Elena. Hello. Kenyon is also on our board. And uh, uh, she has been a past vice president also. And she is one of those board members that have rolled off the board and then come back when she's eligible. And she's and, uh, she is there to help us with hospitality and a lot of other things that we do during the year uh, before COVID. I mean, this young lady ran everywhere, everywhere for us and did a lot of stuff for us. Uh, continue on with board members. We have Maria Yasek. And Maria is with the, you can unmute yourself, Maria. Everybody else, please mute. Uh, Maria uh, is our membership chair, and she was tasked with organizing our membership, uh, and she has done a fantastic job with that. Um, so um, let's see who else is on the board that is here. Uh, we have a young man by the name of Ben Molina who is not on the board, but I called 
mute yourself and give yourself a 30 second. Hi, Heather. My name is Ben. I serve as client services manager with the Alzheimer's Association. Um, so nice to meet you. Um, I also serve on the board for social work leaders in healthcare, and I know that uh, we have made a connection that way. Yeah, and we, we just had a board meeting yesterday, and we're just talking about uh, connecting with you again. So nice to meet you officially. Thank you, Ben. Uh, and then we had uh, another board member just join us, Francisco Carretero. Uh, he is uh, a lawyer in town, and we have advocated for him to get uh, its time for many, many years. He's been uh, a very vibrant lawyer in our, and his parents own Guido's on the Hill, which is a very unique and delicious restaurant. It's, it's, it's Spanish from Spain, an Italian restaurant, and it's on the hill. And uh, we go there a lot of times pre-pandemic uh, for the meeting after the meeting. <laughs> so if we had a meeting like this, we end up at his restaurant sure. to eat late at night. Francisco, say hello to Ms. Heather Fleming. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> hello, this is uh, unmute. You're unmuted. Oh, okay, sorry about that. I've been just swamped today. Hi, how are you? Uh, glad you're, you're uh, joining us for this meeting. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, uh, to listening to your presentation. Thank you. And now we have uh, someone on a phone, which is 314-971-1787. Can you introduce yourself, please? I think the person that just want to be private, so that's okay. Okay, okay. You don't have to uh, divulge who you are if you want to be private on a meeting. That is perfectly okay for anybody else that's listening. We, I also see a name on here for Donna. Don. If you want to mute yourself and introduce yourself, you don't have to, but would be nice if we get to know you. Uh, Tony. Oh, hold on a second. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting used to all these commands. My name is Donna Gilbreth and I work at the United Way of Verde St. Louis. I received an invitation with an interesting topic and I am, uh, look forward to hearing the presentation today. So thank you for allowing me to join you. Very good, thank you. Now uh, we did some of the introduction. We're at 6.06, so we're past our start time and I'll have Mauricio go over some things and then I'll start. Okay, so let's just uh, mute ourselves during this call. And I'm just putting an image out there how to mute yourselves if you don't know. There is this icon in your Zoom on the top, on the bottom left corner, just click on that so you can mute yourself. And uh, we also are gonna ask you to put your questions on the chat. And if you don't know where the chat is located, just see the image that I'm sharing right now. There is an icon out there. Put our questions out there. And uh, Heather and I, I'm gonna be monitoring the questions, but if Heather sees the question out there and she wants to, to the person to speak up, Heather, please just let me know. I will unmute that person and the, and the person can speak, uh, can make the question. Sounds those good. are yeah, those are the only things that I want to mention. And if that said, I will give the word for you, Tony, to uh, just do a brief welcome and then give the words, the stage to Heather. Very good. Thank you, Mauricio. And thanks, everybody, for joining us this evening. I know probably had tons of Zoom meetings during the week and to have another one is taxing, but we appreciate you coming. A young lady that has impressed me very well in my very first meeting with her. Uh, some of the members here already know her. If you can, um, if you can mute yourself. Yeah, I'm gonna mute everybody as of now. Okay, okay. 
Please go, Tony. Yes, yeah, so welcome to our June general membership meeting. We meet every even. Uh, we will start in person again, but for now, we're going to be meeting. Next guest is Heather Fleming. Heather, of, the stage is yours now. Wait a minute, let me finish the bio. Oh, okay. <laughs> Heather is a director of In Purpose Education and author of a book, Friends, and co host of Listen, Learn, Love podcast. Prior to her work in purpose, she spent eight years in the public service sector before moving into education. She served as an English language arts teacher for 14 years before becoming a full-time equity and inclusion training and program design professional. Her goal for her work in this healing, understanding and equity for all. Heather? Tony, you were chopping out your voice. It's hard to hear what you are saying. So I will, I will give the stage to Heather. Okay, um, I can share my screen. Yes, let me make you a co-host over here, just a second. Okay. Okay, Heather. Well, while we're getting everything set up, I just want you all to know that I am so happy, proud, honored um, to be here. For those of you that, that joined the call um, a little bit later, um, we hosted an event and at the event, um, Antonio was there and um, I met him and had an extensive conversation with him. It was such a wonderful pleasure to meet him. And he said, well, listen, I want you to speak at our June meeting. And he was serious. He, the next morning I received an email with full details asking me, you know, everything that I need to know. And so it was just really an honor to be able to um, meet everyone and, excuse me, meet him and, um, Hold on one second, let me, there we go. There's the PowerPoint that I want. So let's get started. If I could find the, there we go. Okay, of course, it is not at the, one second, please. For a little bit, I could see your screen that we're sharing. Now it's coming again. I, great. There we go. That's what I wanted. Let's see, yeah, this. There we go. And so I, I gave um, Tony a few different topics that I could talk about, and this is the one that um, he selected, which was basically how hate grows from the same well, and as a result, we need to be unified in order to fight that hate. So just to give you a little bit of information about me. I am a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, sister, aunt, friend, um, and I'm proud of each and every one of those roles. I am the owner um, and, and founder of In Purpose Educational Services. Um, prior to my work there, I was an educator for 14 years, and then I also served as a case manager and supervisor in the Department of Social Services for seven years. I'm the author of My Black Friend Says, Lessons in Equity, Inclusion, and Cultural Competency, and the eternal St. Louis question, what high school did I graduate, graduate from? I graduated from St. Charles West, home of the Warriors. My maiden name was Grimes. It's so funny, um, one time I was given a presentation and come to find out one of the people in the presentation graduated with my sister. And so they walked up as soon as I said that they were like, she was like, do you know Stacy Grimes? 
Absolutely. We grew up together. We fought over clothes. We definitely know one another. So this are, these are the people that are, um, well, some of the people that are very, very important to me. These are my children. And so I have three biological children and two bonus children. This is my daughter, Ryan. She just turned 13. This is my um, son, Jalen. He's 19. And then my son, Jordan, he is about to turn 25. Um, this is my goddaughter, Kennedy. She also just turned 19. And this is my bonus son, who is actually my oldest son's best friend. My bonus son, Sergio, um, who is, he's 20. Oh, the surge now. He just turned 27 in February. And so these people are, are these of course are the closest to my heart. This, these are my um, three children at my son's graduation. These are my parents. And I'm always proud to show off my parents because they've been divorced for 30 years and yet they are the best of friends. And so it's really cool because we don't ever have to choose when anything is happening. Um, as a matter of fact, my dad's family reunion is this weekend and my mom will be going with us. And so we all get to travel together and have a lot of fun together, we always do. And then this is my very best friend in the world. Um, her name is Barb. We have been friends since uh, we were 18 years old. And so that means we have been friends for exactly 10 years at this point. Um, that's my story and I'm going to stick with it. I always start with this because of the fact that as we have these discussions, I always wanna make sure that people understand I have the same motivations as you. I have the same um, reasons as you. And in the end, these are, these are some of my reasons. Um, I kind of narrowed down some of the pictures because I could show you so many pictures of like my husband, my mother-in-law, my sister-in-law, um, cousins, and just go on and on and on. So this is why I do this work, because in the end, I want everyone that I see here, as well as everyone that I have pictured here, to be able to achieve and live their best life um, and, and achieve as much as possible. So just a little bit, one of the things that Antonio asked me to do is to ask, you know, talk a little bit about in-purpose educational services. And so we began in March of 2018 officially, and it was a result of, of a deep reflection about how I could best impact my community and my country. Um, I was teaching, I had gotten my, my um, certification in secondary school administration, my, my master's degree in May, excuse me, of 2011. And I started interviewing for jobs and I didn't get any jobs. Um, I actually was a finalist for eight different positions, didn't get the positions. And so people think that that's like, oh, that's so sad. It ended up being what's best for me because of the fact, this is what led me to say, you know, no, what am I really supposed to be doing? in my life and it was this work. And so that's the reason why I named it In Purpose because I feel like I'm operating in my purpose now. Um, so when I began the organization, I'm gonna be honest, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I was just kind of bumbling around a little bit trying to figure it all out. And then George Floyd's murder happened. And that's when um, you know, I, I had already been doing the work for Michael Brown, for um, John Crawford, for Trayvon Martin, for, you know, too many people to name, Freddie Gray. Um, but George Floyd's murder was just such an impactful um, event, and it, and it awakened so many people in our society that the work that I was doing became a premium and it became necessary. And so um, I ended up bringing on Katie Sesti as my executive, um, well, at the time she was just gonna be my assistant, but considering all the roles that she plays in our organization, um, we named her position executive manager because she really takes care of all of us. Um, 
And then I eventually brought on Delaney Ray, who is the co-host of my podcast. She is my right hand person. Um, Antonio, let me go back. She is the Sandra Knight to my Antonio. Okay. And so I brought her on. She is now our assistant um, director. I brought her on originally to help me manage a specific program, but her roles again became so expanded that um, we needed a title that really defined what she means to the organization. And then finally, uh, recently we added Chris Carter, one of my former students. They had graduated with their degree in um, project management. And I, I brought them on as an intern and in turn, <laughs> um, they ended up being so significant and, and fitting in so well that um, they are now a full employee with us. And so that's kind of the story of our organization. So what do we do at In Purpose? We do equity audits. We actually designed, uh, we do traditional equity audits, but we also designed a separate program where we go into organizations and companies and we teach them how to kind of self audit um, and, and create their own equity plans. Um, but in the process, we also use that as an opportunity to create equity leaders because organizations are surprised by the fact that my goal is not to create perpetual clients. It's nice if you bring us back, but what my goal really is, is to create um, al you know, allies, advocates, people that can be on my team. And so we go into an organization, we teach them as best as we can, and hopefully we get a lot of independent um, people that are dedicated to equity work that can then partner with us. We also created the LEAP Institute, which was for individuals to do the same thing. Um, how can we bring them uh, up to a point where they feel comfortable and um, capable of being equity leaders within their realms of influence, even when it gets hard? And so that's what we created the um, LEAP Institute around. And we graduated our first um, cohort. We started with 23 people and only the strong survive. So we had about nine that graduated from our program. We also do specially designed training and development programs for um, nonprofits, organizations, companies, schools, school districts, et cetera. So anyone that needs us, we can step in and we can do um, that work. We do mediation services. If there are people in, within an organization that really need to look at mending some of the rifts that have been created by um, diversity conflict. We work to teach them, first of all, that diversity conflict is a natural and normal part of any company that has diverse people. Um, but then next thing, how to do, how to better manage that. And then we mediate between individuals that need that additional assistance. Um, we do consulting services for people that may need help with something small and specific. And then finally, we have webinar series that we are um, placing online, but that um, previously we did live, but now we are actually placing online. I'm really proud of the um, products that we are producing. So our gui guiding question for tonight is going to be, what does it mean that we are facing hate? from the same well. And so that question first leads us to this question, which came first? It actually isn't the chicken or the egg. It is racist policies or racism. Well, if you look at the work of um, Ibram X. Kendi uh, in particular, but other equity um, you know, writers and researchers, one of the things that you find is that in actuality, while we think that racist um, ideas come first, it is actually racist policy, okay? And so racist thoughts come from racist policy. Let me give you an example. Throughout um, our 
American history, we started with, you know, a thought that, hey, it's illegal to educate um, black slaves or enslaved people, rather, I should say, um, black enslaved people. It's illegal to educate them. Then we instituted a bunch of education policies that made our education system unequal, basically. However, what has come from that racist thought is that African Americans are going to, excuse me, that racist policy is that African Americans are going to underachieve because they're less intelligent. But the reason why the underachievement is occurring is because of racist policy. So when we look at why um, our school tax system, property tax, et cetera, system is set up the way that it is, why um, they had redlining, why there are certain neighborhoods uh, and neighborhood schools that are closed down, shut down, but then there are others that are open and fully funded. When we look at some of the racist policies that have happened, that's now where some of the racist thought comes from. So that ends up being important in the discussion that I would like to have. Ultimately, we think about the, the idea of anti-racism and what we're trying to do as anti-racist. And what I, I surprise people with all the time is that we're really not trying to change hearts and minds. We're not trying to change racist thoughts. We're trying to change racist policy because if we change racist policy, autom it'll automatically start changing racist thought. So the true goal of anti-racism is to change or destroy racist structures, not racist thoughts. So when I talk about this idea of us, you know, coming from the hate coming from the same well, we can think back to a lot of legislation that has been specific to groups. So the Fugitive Slave Acts of 1850, um, Jim Crow era legislation, immigration laws, uh, the Chinese exclusion laws, Executive Order 9066, which is the executive order that placed Japanese um, citizens into camps, okay, internment camps. Um, the Indian Removal Act, which forced um, Native Americans to move from their lands into reservations that had poorer, if we're going to be honest, had poorer. Um, you know, land opportunities for cultivation, um, you know, access to animals that they could hunt and, and basically really limited their lifestyle. And so all of these laws were, were um, created for specific reasons, but there's one big reason why most of these laws were created. Can anyone guess what it is? Anyone? Just type in the chat. I'm gonna look at the chat and wait for somebody to make some guesses for me. Oh, thank you, Mauricio. We don't have any guesses. My guess is, is why they were written is racism itself. Right? The, the, the law writers were racist, the policy writers were racist themselves, but that, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> but if we think about this idea that racist policy creates racist thoughts, what was behind the racist policy? Why? Ah, Yvonne, you got it. Money, power, yeah. If you look back at almost any stereotype, any law, any legislation that we could think of and come across, behind it, we're going to find a monetary reason. Now, Alejandra, to 
go along with what you're saying that yes, there were some people, but this is what I want you to think about. Right now, in today's um, atmosphere, right? We have legislators that are intentionally creating laws that, that focus on specific groups with almost precision um, laser focus. Even them, yes, they're using and they're activating identity politics, you know, um, they're using racist dog whistles, they're doing all of this stuff. But if we look behind it, it is about for those particular individuals, activating those feelings so that they can maintain power and continue to um, make money according to a traditional system. And so that is what right now all of us face. When we look at all of the laws that impact you, that impact me, that impact our loved ones, many of them come from that same well and that well is tainted with greed and with power. And as a result of that, also tainted with racism and racist thoughts and racist power. Um, racist policy. So then that's the other thing. Yes, exactly. Racism as a tool of classism. Um, a lot of times people don't think about and they don't read all of Dr. Martin Luther King's speeches and they don't understand fully what he said and what he advocated. He talked about classism and economics almost as much as he talked about racism because they are in they're they're connected it's like uh who was that andrew johnson that said if you can convince the poorest white man that they are better than the best negro you can take they'll hand you the money right out of their pockets and so that's what we see happening we see people that are activating those racist fear racist racial stress etc and it's being reflected not just against people that look like me, but against people that look like you as well. So we also have, and this is what we have to consider, we also have legislation that impacts several groups at once. So for example, the 1994 crime bill. That 1994 crime bill led to such an increase and in not just black, individuals in prison, but also brown individuals in prison. So people of all races, um, except the majority race being in prison. That's because now they had a policy to hide behind. And we're gonna talk in a second about, about where that fits as far as oppression is concerned. Another example is Texas's um, SB4 and other voter ID laws. As soon as, um, oh, what is it? I always forget the case, something V. Holder. Um, Alejandro, what is the case? Uh, I am sorry, I'm, uh, I'll look it up because I know which one you mean, exactly. Yeah, the case that basically stripped the Voting Rights um, Act. Right. Something V. Holder, I always forget it. but. That law did not just impact the ability of African Americans to vote, it really hit hard in Hispanic communities in Texas and in other states. Because as soon as, I mean, it was within days of um, that, that court case, the, the verdict or, or whatever you call it, I'm not a lawyer, I'm an English teacher. Um, Shelby Beholder, thank you, 2013. Shelby Beholder. Yes, thank you. So within days, honestly, of that um, decision coming back, Texas passed SB4. And what that ended up doing is suppressing the vote in Texas, primarily of Hispanic populations. Um, 
immigration policy. Immigration policy was put into place right now. We have an immigration policy that favors people that are immigrating from countries um, who are predominantly white. And so that is a, a policy that was uh, in, you know, implemented, but really has a, a negative impact on people from all minority, well, what would be the minority in our country um, populations. And then anti-terrorism initiatives. And so we have a lot of laws right now about anti-terrorism, but we can see after the events of January 6th, that people are still hesitant to call a spade a spade and to say and name crimes committed by certain groups as terrorism when it would be very easy to say they were terrorists in uh, uh, other situations, okay? So again, when I say the same well, here's the, here's the something interesting that I found. If we look at any type of oppression, this is the work of Dr. Michael Brazel. If we look at any type of oppression, we could categorize it according to these four types, all right? And so that means homophobia, that means, um, you know, xenophobia, um, racism, we can go down the whole list. We can put it and, and categorize it into these four types of oppression. So the first type is entitled oppression. When people say, you know, the loaded word, oh my gosh, that was racist. This is what they often think about, okay? This is what the person being accused often thinks about. It's the entitled oppression. And they put it, um, you know, on the same level, and they think about it on the same level as, you know, what Hitler did, um, what happened in Charlottesville, um, what happened at the border under Trump. We can go down a whole list, but you get what I'm saying. This is overt and it's intentional. People mean for it and they're doing it out loud, okay? So that's what people's minds automatically go to when we say that something is racist, sexist, you know, xenophobic, homophobic, et cetera. The worst examples. Okay, I see it, uh, refugees and many immigrants are poor, so they are not seen as adding to the West establishment same as much other poor. That is so cool that she said that because we're gonna talk about that in a little bit too, okay? Uh, the next is consciously hidden oppression. Consciously hidden oppression is still intentional, but it's covert, okay? What people do is they kind of hide behind rules and regulations, and they know that they can't be out loud with it. And so um, they might, like if, if someone, two people go into a, to get a bank loan, one person is Hispanic and the other person is white, and they have the exact same um, credentials. If you have a conscious, somebody that's displaying consciously hidden oppression, they might give this person a chance while denying this person saying, well, you know, it's policy. Our policy says you have to have at least this much. Da, 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 when in the end, they could have um, approved both people because they had the ability to, but they chose not to. Um, here's the reality, and, and you all know this, uh, I'm sure you've experienced it. Most of what we experience won't fall into the intentional categories. Most of what we experience as far as oppression is concerned will actually fall into unintentional, really good people that just don't know. They haven't learned, they haven't had to have the conversations, et cetera. And so the next category ends up being reasonable oppression. That is unintentional, but it's very overt. It's obvious, okay? And so um, with reasonable oppression, it's the stuff we've gotten used to. We've just accepted that that's just how it is. That's just how it goes. 
So we've accepted in St. Louis that our neighborhoods are hugely segregated, okay? It's racist, it's xenophobic, but it's reasonable for most people, okay? Um, it is accepting that there are certain populations that will not be as well serviced by our institutions and systems, such as if we go to almost any um, predominantly African-American school or predominantly Hispanic school, what are we going to find? We're going to find underachievement. We're going to find under, you know, people being understaffed, not enough funding, all of these things to happen, but we've accepted it. The reality is that's not gonna happen in Chesterfield, okay? There are people that would set the whole district on fire if their children were consistently underperforming like that, okay? And so we've become used to it. We've accepted it. And then the final is the unconscious oppression. That is, oh, oh excuse me, covert and it's unintentional. And so it's the subtle things, the little things. It's, I wanna give you an example that always bothers me. And my um, co-host and my director, Delaney, Delaney is actually biracial. She's part um, New Mexican. And um, she says with her family, cause they're like Taos Indian and uh, excuse me, Taos Native American, et cetera, that, you know, they, their family didn't cross the border, the border crossed them. <laughs> and so they've been in the New Mexico area for forever, but she identifies as Hispanic. And so one of the things that bothers her is um, of course, people wearing sombreros for Cinco de Mayo, you know, Mexican Independence Day. That is an example. It's unconscious oppression. This is about the fact that here's a bunch of people that have no idea about the richness of your culture or even like the historic events, et cetera, et cetera. So they don't mean to be um, oppressive. They don't mean to cause harm. They actually sometimes think that they're connecting with you. I remember students coming to me and saying things like, what's up, girlfriend? And I had to be like, no, baby, I don't say that. So you're stereotyping me now, you know? Um, yeah, so that, I'll leave that alone. So the biggest thing to think about is, is that here, when we look at what I mentioned before, um, this is where we are even right now. We're looking at people using consciously hidden oppression in order to implement policy and procedure that actually benefits them, but oppresses other groups. We recently heard one of the leaders of the Republican Party saying, hey, we don't need the John Lewis Voting Act because we already have enough laws. When those same leaders know that in 43 states, they are attempting to implement laws that will limit the vote of minority voters. They know that, but they're hiding behind, well, we already have laws to protect you. So that is what we have to be aware of and that what we have to know as we're going forward. And the reality is just inequity abounds. And I just realized that I didn't print out my notes. So I've got to like <laughs> try to remember everything that I put in here. So inequity abounds, so let's examine it. When we look at the Hispanic community, as far as COVID-19 is concerned, they found that Hispanics and Latinos were 1.7 times more likely to contract COVID-19 
than their non-Hispanic um, white counterparts. They were four time, 4.1 times more likely to be hospitalized and 2.8 times more likely to die. That's unacceptable. That's also a, a sign of systemic um, racism and systemic inequity. And guess what? Other community of, communities of color, including my community, were also disproportionately impacted by that. So then let's look for jobs. During the pandemic, Hispanic populations, Hispanic people were 23% of the initial job losses. Now, keep in mind, I think the Hispanic populations are like 16 or so percent of the population. And so that's way too much. Um, Black and Hispanic or Latino Americans still represented the higher share of job losses with unemployment rates of 9.2% and 8.6% respectively. That was compared with 5.7% for their white counterparts. And then more so, the Latino employment level is still 7.2% below its pre-pandemic mark, um, comparable to 7% deficit for Black Americans, but five, only 5.2% 5 for white Americans. All right, look for this. Okay. During COVID, when we look at salaries and money, on average, full-time Hispanic or Latino workers earn just $742 per week in the fourth quarter of 2020. That is compared with $791 per week earned by their Black counterparts, but far below the $1,007 earned by their white counterparts. So basically, COVID exacerbated the wealth gap even more. Um, I could go on and give you example after example, example, but the point of this is that we're all impacted. We're all in the same boat because of what has been drawn out of that well, that same well that we're in. And so as a result, we all need to be in this together. Um, Dr. Danielle Allen, she's a researcher at, I believe it was Stanford, but I don't quote me on that. Um, she wrote a chapter in a book called Our Compelling Interest. If anyone has an opportunity to read that book, it is absolutely wonderful. Um, but she had a chapter called Towards a Connected Society. And within that chapter, she talked about the relationships that we need to be building. And so I just want you to know that this is why I'm here today, um, because this is what I want to help build. What they find is that racial segregation continues to have a significant impact on American life. Um, and the present it has been pretty conclusively shown to be at the root of racial inequality along all dimensions. So that's educational inequalities in terms of achievement gaps between white and African-American students, inequality and distribution of wealth, inequality in terms of employment mobility, being able to move jobs and get better jobs, um, inequality in terms of health. The health, I didn't get to get into the, like the health disparities, but wow. And, and again, African Americans and Hispanics are right there together in the inadequacy of services that we receive. So, and poor African Americans and Latina, Latino, Latinx, are now more likely to face hyper segregation, which means we're not just separated like out from white populations, we're separated from each other as well. 
And this gets back to who mentioned Yvonne, what Yvonne said about refugees and many immigrants are poor, so they are not seen as adding to the wealth of the establishment, same as most other poor. Um, it all ends up being about perception, but it also ends up being about reality too. Um, the problem is, is that in our society, we have what's called deficit-based thinking. Deficit-based thinking basically places the blame and looks for the blame within the populations themselves instead of within the system. So if immigrants are poor, we go and try to find the reason why it's their fault. If Black students underachieve, we try to figure out why it's their fault. That's the reason why we had initiatives like character education. And then we had something where it talked about grit and how people just needed to have grit. No, they need to have systemic barriers removed. All right, so then she continues a little bit later to say a connective society is one in which people can enjoy the bonds of solidarity, excuse me, um, and community, but are equally engaged in the bridging work of bringing diverse communities into positive relationships while also individually forming personally viable relationships across boundaries of difference. So basically our work and what we need to be doing, um, what Alejandra and I are going to be doing, um, we're going to be bonding individually. We're also going to be looking at what are ways that our communities can, can come together as well because the more that we break down those boundaries between the two communities, the more we are going to accomplish and be able to conquer. So importantly, in a connected society, the boundaries among communities of solidarity are fluid. So we're gonna to try to make each other a community of solidarity between Hispanic populations, Black populations, Hispanic groups, Black groups. Um, and the shape of those communities can be expected to change over time. So for me, the takeaway, and I hope that each of you are able to take this away too, um, we need to not only come together, um, we need to establish relationships because it's going to be, and, and, and this is the case where um, the relationships become really important. It's going to be those relationships that create the systemic change that we need to see. It just is. There's more power in our combined voices. And so I ask, you know, my organization is always willing to work with any organization, any person that has a shared mission with us. And honestly, our shared mission is to create a connected society. Our shared mission is to, um, you know, bring people together and teach them how to love and care for one another better. I need to learn more about how to care for your community. And in the return, I can teach you more about how to care for mine. And in doing that, we can change all of our communities for the better. So that's my presentation. Thank you all for having me. And I will take any questions, anything you want to talk about. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Heather. And uh, I, it's like I know you, so I'm, I'm going to be informal and call you Heather, like yes. I would call a friend, right? So <laughs> let's everybody acknowledge Heather for her presentation by doing the the you know acknowledgement shake. I know we can't hear everybody applauding, but we can all shake our hands in acknowledgement and thank you so much for that that's uh, awesome thank you so now we will have a question and answer and mauricio if you raise your uh your hand like i just did just now mauricio will call you and and then you can unmute yourself and ask the question like Maria, oh, Alejandra, then 
You guys all have questions? Awesome. Uh, Maria, 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 go ahead. Yes, Maria, please go ahead. Okay. Um, my question to you is: What kind of what books do you recommend uh, for us to get up to know more about the issues involved and how we can better become a connected society? And I wanted also to learn know if you had read um, the book um, Why Fragility and Thought, thought about it. There are so many books right now. My whole like, I I could recommend so many. I'm just gonna pull out a couple that I really really love. Um. So. This is not even all of them. Okay. Well, just give us that. Yeah, let me just give you a favor. Okay. Two of your favorites. So, <laughs> well, one is a lovely little bit book that I call My Black Friend Says Lessons in Equity, Inclusion, and Cultural Competency. It's my book. So, I recommend that book, of course. And the cool part is we just finished a companion manual or a companion guide to go along with the reading to really help people with reflecting on what we're talking about. And so um, look for that to come out soon too. Um, another one, this one, Our Compelling Interest. It is really about the bigger idea of society. Um, and so I, I just love some of the essays within it because it talks about like economic impacts of diversity um, and what else, um, diversity and in institutional life, just all kinds of stuff, but it's from a societal standpoint. So if you're a community leader, I think it's good to have that so that you can understand some of the bigger issues of the community as a whole. Did um, you read my fragility? I did. It's wonderful, and I actually use some of the examples in um, my own <laughs> book. Um, yes, because she talks very frankly and very honestly about one of the bigger issues. And so mm -hmm. when I'm doing training, I talk to white people. Well, first thing I do that I think that a lot of diversity training really misses is that they don't prepare people that have never had to utilize certain skills or even learn them, they don't give them the skills. So the reality is, you know, for us to sit and talk about race or for us to sit and talk about, you know, xenophobia, et cetera, it is different because it impacts our lives and we've had to talk about it more. We've had, we've, we have the words, we have the um, coping skills, we have all of those things. And so a lot of, too much of diversity training makes the assumption that everyone who's going to be participating has those same skills and they just don't. So my um, training always starts with a lot of, um, um, skill building. And then in the process, what it also does is it gives anybody that's participating of any race common language. And so white fragility is one of the places that I get the, mm -hmm. some of the common language, including the ideas about whiteness, what whiteness is and how whiteness impacts everyone. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. No problem. One of my other favorite books, Stand From the Beginning by Ibram X. Kendi. It is pretty much the entire history of anti-Black racism starting in the 1400s and going all the way up to um, present day. Um, Dying of Whiteness. This is a really good book because it's about politics and how um, the politics of racial resentment, something I talked, what I talked about in this particular presentation, how um, that is actually having a really negative effect on white America as well. Um, Ibram X. Kendi again, how to be an anti-racist is amazing. And then Idioma Aluo, so you want to talk about race. So those are some of my favorites. Thank um, you. No okay. problem.
Okay. I, will, I will give the word to Ben Molina. Ben, please go ahead. Thanks, Mauricio. Um, well, I just want to say thank you, Heather. Um, um, I, I've learned so much from this presentation. I think in, in this fight for equity, there's just so much learning that needs to continuously happen. Um, uh, I, I think as I, I, I I wasn't born in the United States. I moved to the United States when I was nine years old and I, I went through grade school and, and high school where you, you learn about slavery and how, um, you know, as a kid, you don't really understand it. It's, it's a negative thing and you think it's bad, but you don't really understand how policy really impacts and continues to impact the lives of uh, people of color in the United States. Um, and so, I, I really appreciated this uh, this presentation because it, it it in my mind it reframed that racism doesn't doesn't um, result in policy. It's policy that that uh, causes racism. Or um, so so I really appreciated that. Um, Thank and, you. And you know, going forward, there's still so much work that needs to be done in, in St. Louis in the United States. You know, how can we stay engaged in, in the work that In Purpose is doing or in in in, in this um, fight? Um, so as far as staying engaged with the work that In Purpose is doing, um, of course, you can always follow our social media, you can um, check our website. But uh, one of the things that I always want people to realize is that, you know, it's not just about In Purpose. If, um, I'll never forget, there was a week that I went into a full panic attack. Um, I run a, an equity, a liberal crafting group on Facebook that has 5.6 thousand people in it, okay? And somebody came on, just really giving me a lot of accolades and it freaked me out. And the reason why it freaked me out is because of the fact that with this work, my entire goal for it is to make more connections and make our table as big as possible. It is not to be placed on a pedestal. So one of the things that you can do to stay engaged with our work is, you know, talk to me, email me, invite me. I am more than willing to come. Um, one, of, one of the people I think that you all know, Sal Valadez, I met him, we were on a panel together. And from that panel, you know, we talk via um, email, he sends me articles, et cetera, because he's trying to also help improve my work and my organization, as well as, you know, anything that I can help him with or provide for him, I will, although I don't know what I could contribute to someone that accomplished, but, <laughs> you know, so that's the other thing. Please, 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 you know, don't think, um, no, I don't want to bother her. No, bother me because we, it's all about making those connections. Um, the other thing to realize is that we have, I don't want to make it like a political, you know, this versus that, but we have individuals in our political life whose entire goal is to make people tired so that they disengage. And so the other thing that I would really recommend doing is, you know, continue to be knowledgeable, continue to be checked in, continue to look at other organizations within our, um, within our community who are really trying to do this work and join together, partner with them where you can. Um, yeah, because it, it should, that's what we should be doing right now as a network is, is coming together to see how can we lend our collective power towards um, creating change. Okay, uh, thank you, Heather. And uh, now Tony wants to, to make a question. So Tony, it's your time now. You, have, you are muted, Tony. You have to unmute yourself. Hello, everybody. Well, thank you so much again. And thanks for everybody that got on the Zoom. This has been very informative. And you know, sometimes, uh, we have a saying, or my wife and I have a saying that goes, God rides straight with crooked lines. And this presentation uh, came in a timely manner because I had a meeting with our representative and a senator uh, two days ago 
and we talked about the uh, cross-cultural phenomena that happens in the United States. But and then we got a little deeper into how the Caribbean was uh, dealt with for hundreds of years before the United States dealt with cultural uh, engagement, right? When you had the, the old world European Spaniards come and discover this part of the world, then you had Columbus go in 1492 and he discovered Puerto Rico and there were some of the other islands in the Caribbean and right. how that started a whole new thing in this, uh, in the new world, right? One of the interesting things that I found a fact for, for uh, Senator Mosley and Representative uh, Jay Mosley was this, there was a man one of the most influential forces behind the creation of the New York Public Library's Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture is the man the building is named after, Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. He was born in Puerto Rico in 1874 to a Black mother and a father of German descent. Yeah. Talk about, you know, cross-cultural engagement. He was born in 1874. Right. And he often wondered the lack of, this is where it comes to that saying, well, he often wondered about the lack of African history that was taught in his classrooms. His interests formed a cornerstone of Schomburg's eventual life work consisting of research and preservation, work that would lead him to become one of the world's premier collectors of black literature, slave narratives, artwork, and diasporic materials. So it's very interesting that in 18 something, things were being done because the African culture was not being documented. It was not being uh, praised. It was not being uh, recorded in history. Yeah. Okay. So that's a systemic, what I think is a systemic it really is. Uh, inequity because we learned all about the Spaniards. We learned about the European. We learned about some of the native. Uh, and that's that true. But again, we learned very um, basic information. I feel like most of the most of the information that we learned were about European Spaniards, like you said, the French, um, in certain amounts, the Germans. If we go back, we learned about Greece. We learned about um, Rome. But we have to always consider, again, even now, as we're looking at some of the laws that people are trying to put into place, what, why are they excluding what they're excluding? So why did they exclude African history? To everyone, you would think that Africans had no history, really, mm -hmm. um, and that it all began with slavery. So. And I always tell people, no, slavery interrupted our history. It's not our history, it interrupted our history. And so honestly, you don't wanna get me started on African history because I absolutely love it. I love the, the, the civilizations and everything, but that's just it. Why aren't we learning about you know, the history of the Southwest? Why aren't we learning about more about Native American history and historical figures, um, there's a reason, you know? At the back of my book, I actually made a list of 365, you can't see it, um, 365 different topics that you can look up each day for a year. And it, it covers all kinds of history, including um, Mexican history, Hispanic, you know, great figures in Hispanic history, um, indigenous, African, just all of these different, because in the end, it's, it's crazy to me that 
we're just, so many people are just now learning about what happened in Tulsa in 1921. That's true. And, and again, that's one of the, those things that, that history about Tulsa, and then I got the fact about Schomburg, and then I was talking uh, with, with the other people about the, you know, the engagement that we're having uh, cross-culturally. I mean, uh, so this is all timely, and I think that uh, I look forward to some of your generation to come up with with the research and come up with the studies. But I'm 73 and I never stop wanting to learn. You know, I always yeah. wanting to learn new things. Can you believe that I'm Puerto Rican and I never heard of Arturo? Never heard of him until I had to research uh, uh, some facts. And now, you know, I learned about it. So next, and I was raised in New York. Never yeah. heard of that public library with his name on it. Since yeah. 18 something. So, <laughs> yeah, there is, it's there a shame, is, but you know, that's the thing about it. The other thing to make sure of is that we understand that when we begin to say that this is what we are going to do as far as this work is concerned, um, number one, the understanding that it is a process of unlearning. So, unlearning the, the bad. Um, and, and misinformation that we have learned about other people, other cultures, and how to treat them. But pairing with that is simultaneously a process of learning. It always has to be about learning. I have to be learning about you, you have to be learning about yeah. me. And then right. finally, it is about action. We're doing that on learning and the relearning so that we can take action that will really effectuate change for you and for me. So I thank you all. I appreciate you. If anyone would like to get in contact with me, my email, look, I'll put my email in the, the, chat. Uh, in the chat so that you feel free to contact me. Um, I did want to address this and then I will let you all know. Make sure you put two E's right there. So in purpose, E-A. Um, Yvonne asked a really good question about, is there a particular policy in St. Louis that we should focus on the most? Right now we see a, conferred, a, a concerted effort to erase and eliminate um, uh, the ability for students, teachers, et cetera, to learn about me and about you. And so I, um, I have created a group called the Missouri Equity Education Support Group. We are currently planning an event. It will be at Youth in Need in St. Charles on July 17th. It's going to be a very kid-friendly event. We're going to have snow cones and um, popcorn and all that kind of good stuff, games for the kids to play. But more than that, the adults will be having conversations about um, you know, what equity work really is and why it's important. And if anyone has an organization that they feel would be, um, they would want represented from an, you know, as, a, as a, an organization that promotes equity, including the Hispanic Leaders Group, please, please, please um, contact me. And I'm talking about equity of any type. So, yes. you know, if we, age, um, sex, sexual orientation, um, any, of, any of them, culture, um, you know, ethnicity, race, any, any organization that's going to promote equity and understanding among us, we, we want to make sure that you have space to set up a table and to be able to give information out to people about ways that they can help and to join in, so. Very good, very good. Very good. Thank you. Again, thank Heather, you and so thanks much. everybody. We uh, we started a little late and we ended a little late. So in order to respect people's time, uh, our meeting has come to to an end. And uh, I thank everybody so much. We'll see you at the next general uh, membership meeting in August. Um, and everybody have a good good beginning of summer, right? You guys have a good time and be safe. Uh, stay COVID safe 
continue to wear your mask and use your hand sanitizers. Don't and, trust these people. Uh, Don't trust from the bottom of my heart, I love you guys. Take care. Uh, Heidi, Taylor, Arnold, thank you for I'll joining you us. Me. You're quiet all this time. Thank you so much. You guys take care. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye, Heather. Bye, Thank you so much. Love Call it. Me I will. I will. Yeah, we'll do something together. Bye. Yes, please. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody, and thank you.